Welcome, everyone. We are so pleased that you could join us this evening for an anti-racist take on oppression and sorrow. I'm Alex Elliott, the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, we CIIS public programs must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional unceded Ramaytush Ohlone lands. If you're interested in learning more about native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now let me first introduce our presenters, Brisha Wade and Bree McDaniel, and then we'll get right to their conversation. Bree McDaniel is a licensed clinical psychologist, consultant, and facilitator. Her work primarily centers and affirms the lived experience of marginalized and underserved communities. Currently, Dr. McDaniel teaches in the clinical psychology program and serves as the director of Psychological Services Center at CIIS. She also has a consultation and psychotherapy practice in Oakland, California. Primary areas of focus in Dr. McDaniel's practice include cultivating a more inclusive workplace culture, trauma and recovery, intersectionality, marginalization, disenfranchisement and oppression, pursuing freedom and discovering joy. Brigia Wade holds an undergraduate degree in comparative studies from Stanford University, a graduate degree in religious studies from the University of Chicago, and has completed a two-year Buddhist chaplaincy program. During her career, Brigia has supported people during transitions both at the beginning and end of life as a birth doula and Buddhist chaplain. She has worked with incarcerated populations, on the mother-baby units of hospitals, and in people's homes. Additionally, she has led grief workshops and conferences along the West Coast, including those at UC Berkeley, the University of Washington, and Stanford University. And now it is my absolute joy to turn it over to Brigia and Bree. Hi, Brigia. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for being with us today. How are you? Good, good. I'm glad to be here. and I'm excited to be in conversation with you. Me as well. Um, I really enjoyed reading your book. It really resonated with me. Um, there was so much that, that landed and, and mirrored my lived experience. And I guess I wanted to thank you for um, writing, writing so many Black women's truths down. I thought I would start by asking, since the book is about grief, if you could define for us how, what grief looks like to you, especially since so many black women's rage and anger is, is uh, so much, so many black women's grief is misunderstood as rage and anger. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing your experience and you know, your reaction to the book. Um, because writing is a solitary process <laughs> and like thinking and feeling, uh, you know, um, it's a gift to hear how someone else, especially another black woman received the work. So um, thank you for that. I feel like being able to, to write the book and put it out into the world um, has allowed me to feel in community uh, with other black women who I otherwise wouldn't, you know, have that direct or intimate relationship with. Um, for me, the way I define grief, well, let me start by talking about the way that, you know, grief is typically defined. Um, usually when we talk about grief, uh, we, we think of, a, of past and concrete loss. Um, and when we're talking about Black women, Black people, Black LGBTQ folks, grief in particular, there's a lot of past and current loss that one can look to and think of as grief. Um, and the way that I explore grief um, in the book is much larger than um, a past and current context. Um, I talk about the ways in which grief is also um, prevalent in the way that we think about the future uh, through our relationship to fear of loss because we are all born into the world um, with a finite, finite amount of time. We all know um, that we have a relationship to mortality um, and impermanence. So even if we're in a situation where we think, hey, you know, my life's been pretty great. Um, my 
family was great. My friends are great. I have a great job. You know, there's still that fear of loss that tends to plague people. Um, and it often shows up uh, in, in the form of anxiety. It could be anxiety about losing the great job you have. It could be anxiety about losing the respect of your, your coworkers. It could be um, anxiety, especially for women, of walking down the street. Um, by yourself, even if you've walked down the street a thousand times and gotten to wherever it is, wherever it is you want to want to go, and you've gotten there safely, uh, safely, there's still that awareness of what you have to lose, and that awareness um, is also associated with grief, and that's the type of grief that I really wanted uh, to break open and explore. And in terms of Black women, and um, you alluded to our our rage and our anger, um, rage and, and anger are forms of grief and they are legitimate forms of grief. But because black women are so dehumanized within our culture, our legitimate anger um, and legitimate rage when we experience it is used to further dehumanize us and further ostracize us. Um, when, you know, if I don't believe that grief necessarily has stages, I do believe that grief has expressions. Um, and it's well documented that rage and anger are a part of grief, um, but that's not something that you know readily comes to mind when you think of the angry black woman, um, because you know to to put us in relationship to grief would further humanize us, and the point is to make us seem um, unsympathetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that makes so much sense, and I'm just thinking about what you mentioned about the five stages of grief and that it's not so much about stages, but expressions of grief. I really like that. Uh, I have not heard that before. I really like that. Um, there's so much imagery in the book. Um, and I want to just read a sentence that I saw in the preface that really spoke to me and mm -hmm. ask you a question about it. Uh, so you noted <clears throat> tragedies kept alive by silence, haunting generations, memories recorded in bodies, restless and weary, all waiting to be spoken. When I heard these ghosts knocking in the closets of my unconscious, I was afraid to answer for fear the question of what the questions may bring. I'm curious what made you finally open the door? Yeah. Um, choosing my own survival and my own humanity. Um, as Black people collectively, and from my own experience as a LGBTQ Black woman, um, so much has been taken from us and so, so much is constantly under threat of being taken. You know, we've lost so much non-consensually that we are so driven and afraid of what else we have to lose because we aren't left with much besides what we protect. Mm -hmm. um, and those defense mechanisms of, you know, um, guarding ourselves from experiencing grief and pain by being defensive and not being um, vulnerable it closes us further off from our humanity because being human as a Black person in the United States pretty much um, pretty much puts you at risk. You know, like our humanity and our vulnerability um, are the very things that have been perverted and taken advantage of, and that has to be, uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest tragedies um, of what we've endured. Um, so for me, the journey um, and the decision to, to open the, that door and to listen was to choose myself, choose my humanity um, in a culture and society that was constant, that's constantly trying to deny that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, <clears throat> so again, the, the book is full of imagery and I kind of chuckled to myself when you were discussing learning how to swim. I also, mm -hmm. I don't know how to, I don't know how to swim. And so <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a point where you, in this really beautiful and eloquent way you talk about, you're talking about power and helplessness and learning how to harness power when you're speaking about a friend of yours and mm -hmm. that she was able to float because she could harness, she learned how to harness the power of the waves. Could you speak a little bit about helplessness and powerlessness and, and harnessing power? Sure. Um, 
I want to start by saying you can never be better than that which you imitate. And when we are trying to to build paths of healing and possibilities for um, a new future in a culture that has, um, you know, demeaned and, and denigrated so many people, we can't look to that same culture as an example for how we understand power and how we understand grief and how we understand relationships. So for me, um, I mentioned in the book that I, I took le- swing lessons like four or five times, right? I, I can finally float now, but let me tell you, that was hard earned. <laughs> like, it was, and, and you know, due to COVID, I haven't been able to continue, which has really been a loss. But I remember just being in tears and over the moon when my body was finally able to float. Um, but in, in the story that I shared in the book, I was in Cuba um, with a couple of my girlfriends and we were, you know, playing in the ocean, obviously where I could stand up. <laughs> and, you know, this friend, was you know she was trying to to show me how to to float and every time I've learned attempted to learn how to swim um there's so many lessons that I learned about myself like one lesson um, I think this is like my second or third time um was noticing how I sink much more quickly and I have trouble treading water if you know I get into the water and I'm angry because of the way that I'm holding my body and the way that I'm tensing. So there is a lot of mindfulness that went into the practice and, and went into each attempt um, when I was taking lessons. Um, but with this friend, I remember she she leaned back into the water and she was showing me like, hey, like, you know, you can jump with the waves. You, you don't try to to fight and go against them. And that really stuck with me for, for months. Um, And I I think in that same passage, I talk about, you know, meeting Miss McDaniel, I think is the name I gave to her. Um, And I think, you know, the whole swimming thing um, really broke open my relationship to power when I met her and had that interaction. But ultimately we have been taught, um, we have been fooled into thinking that power is something that we can have and that we can own and that we manipulate instead of understanding that power is something that has us. And it is our job as human beings to be a vessel for power and to ensure that when power um, operates through us or flows through us and and, and when we, you know, come into relationship um, with other sources that have power, that we are a, as clean of a vessel as we can be. Um, so that it doesn't get misused. And by that, I mean, um, we are constantly aware and attending to um, our own relationship to grief, our own relationship to trauma and anger and whatever it might be such that when we are coming, when we are coming in, into contact with our relationship to power and we're encountering other sources of power, whether it be the ocean or power um, that's flowing through other people, we don't attempt to misuse that. Um, so really when I was learning to swim and the way I started to think about power, instead of like something that A, I own and I have and B, um, looking at other sources like the ocean and those waves as, you know, an entity with power, instead of looking at that as something I needed to conquer and overcome, I looked at it as something that I needed to lean into and give into, um, as, you know, um, something I could influence, like I can influence or have an impact on the waves by treading the water and, and moving my hands. But ultimately, you know, when I enter into the water, when I establish a relationship with the ocean or another person, I come into it with the understanding that I can't control it, which means that I can't control the outcomes. You know, there are so many powerful swimmers or there have been powerful swimmers um, who still get overcome by the waves in the ocean. Um, and accepting and giving myself over to that process um, has helped me understand the difference between being, you know, powerless and helpless. Like I'm powerless because I, I do not own power. Power is not mine to have. I am not powerful. I can't take or give power because power is not of me or from me to take or give. But I am not helpless, and that I still have agency and how I choose to be in relationship to power and how I choose to allow power to to flow through me by doing my own work. Mm-hmm. You know, this actually makes me think about another question um, that I had, I had had earlier 
around outcomes. You just mentioned outcomes. And I was just thinking about how there's so much hyper focus on outcome. Yes. And I think it, it, just, it keeps <laughs> us stuck. And I, I guess I just was curious if you had thoughts about that. Um, just like the stuckness or like the, the hyper focus on, on outcome, which we have no, we don't have any control over it. Yeah, I mean, and that's the culture we live in. Uh, and those are the, I'm, I'm Buddhist. So those are the delusions that we have been, um, that we, we bought into. Um, but ultimately, also it, it's unfortunate that so many people um, move through the world and that superficial relationship to power, you know, being able to say, I did the thing that I said I was going to do or being able to control a situation or being able to bring about a certain outcome is the only relationship to power they come to understand when power is so much deeper and more, more profound um, than that. But um, yeah, the, the emphasis on outcomes and, and being able to control things is something that we, we buy into all the time. And I want to draw, a, a you know, establish a difference between controlling something and having influence um, because if we could control, truly control outcomes, then impermanence would be something that we would never have to fear or experience. You know, if we could, if we actually had as much power and control as we would like to imagine, um, you know, uh, due to the, the delusions and the false confidences that we're given in our day-to-day -day life, you know, we wouldn't have to fear losing the people we love. We wouldn't have to fear, you know, um, the, the outcome of, um, of whether or not we, we have our job or the consequences of certain behavior. Um, there would just be much less fear of loss because we could control it, you know, we wouldn't die. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we can influence circumstances. Like I can influence um, whether or not I lose my job by choosing to show up <laughs> or maybe not telling my boss how I feel about him today, right? Or um, I can influence uh, my health by choosing to, I guess, eat this kale right now instead of that Wendy's burger uh, for the, the sixth day in a row <laughs> with a milkshake, right? Like they're, they're like things that you can do to influence certain outcomes. But, you know, at the end of the day, none of us have full control or ultimate say um, over what does and does not happen. And I think that coming, into, coming to terms with that reality is so terrifying. Um, for most people and it's just safer or feels safer on the surface to to focus on um, the power that only results in feeling like you can control your outcomes. Mm -hmm. yeah which is delusional as I think you said or at least I, I read um, yeah <laughs> um since we're talking about power I'll, I'll stay on this line um so I, I'm thinking about the ways in which people use power to oppress um, others. Um, and I'm just curious when thinking about power and privilege, do you think there's motivation or what do you think the motivation would be to give up unearned privileges, which you, you, you speak to a reference in the book? Yeah, um, the motivation would be getting in touch with one's own humanity and also letting go of fear. You know, I, I it's it's kind of is it cir cyclical, circular? I'm not sure which word I'm looking for. It, it's kind of circular in that a lot of oppressive actions and systems come from fear. You know, I uh, believe I mentioned earlier in the book that. Um, I believe that systemic oppression of all types, even though I focus on uh, systemic racism and, and, and sex of, or misogynoir, misogynoir in particular, um, come from the, the realization uh, from, you know, the oppressor or the person who is misusing power the most that fear of loss and impermanence are a thing. So mm -hmm. time is a finite resource, money, finite resource, which, you know, in our culture and the way it sets up, gives you time, um, you know, the time we spend with people we love, finite resource, like everything is finite. And in order to buy or to give ourselves uh, more opportunities to explore with a hobby or um, with our children um, and, and wife in my case, um, or relaxing, 
um, whatever it is that we want to experience more of, I, I think that humans in general, but in the context of systemic racism and white supremacy, um, the idea is that somebody else needs to pay for my ability to have more access to time. Like somebody else needs to not be able to rest, not be able to have time um, with their family, not be able to, to have money so that I can have these things. So that um, to not be able to have as many opportunities for jobs, you know, um, because if Grisha comes across a desk uh, with a spectacular resume and it's compared to Drew, I don't know, <laughs> you know, um, you know, the system is set up uh, such that Drew has more opportunities than Brisha is given from the get-go by virtue of who we are and who the world imagines us to be so that Drew then has more money, then has um, more time to relax, then has, you know, more of an ability to build the life that he wants to build so that he can make the most of his time. And that is coming at a direct cost to me. And I think the, the misuse of power comes from that fear, you know, and then it perpetuates that fear because then you have a lot more that you reported and a lot more to protect. Um, and you can't, you can't control the fact that the very people that you want to oppress, the only way that you can oppress them is by putting them, keeping them in proximity to you. And when somebody or something has proximity to you, <laughs> then they have the ability to harm you, right? They have the ability to take away the very things that you have taken. So then there's that added fear of having a experienced you know, um, what it's like to have those, those extra resources that have been stolen um, from, from lives that did not consent to give those things up. Um, and then there's you know, more, there's like a, a, a tightening on, on that power that didn't belong um, to, to an oppressor to begin with. Um, and I believe leaning into the basic fear that the basic fear of impermanence and grief and fear of loss allows all of us to make the most of our time and to experience life fully and, and equitably. J just acknowledging that, yeah, hey, you know, impermanence is real, grief is real, fear of loss is real. This is um, the amount of time that I'm, I'm given and I understand that I actually can't control outcomes. Um, but with the time that I'm given, at least I have greater access to the humanity that's been gifted to me because I'm not living under all of this fear that I have created by constantly taking, um, taking from and oppressing the people around me. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Okay. Yeah, thank you. This makes me think about a couple of different points in the book. It makes me think about grief, but it also makes me think about, there's a passage um, where you speak about white people having a 500 year advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and you share, you said something like black folks can't stop, like we can't slow down because then we won't be able to pass the, the baton onto the next generation. There, like there's no time, like time is like of the essence and running out. Um, and so my mind was going there when you were when you were talking about time, but then I was also thinking about how um, there's a part where you you reference. Um, I was thinking about anticipatory grief, and there's a point where you say I'll, I'll read it. Um, the first death black parents talk to their children about is their their children's own. Parents of marginalized children live intimately with the reality of embodied time. Time is not a given. And of course, no black person or no black parent is um, wanting their child to die and is, is, is not hoping for that. Like the hope is that their they won't have to bury their child. But unfortunately, this yeah. is really common in our community, our communities. Um, can you share a little bit about that or speak to that? Yeah, um, I mentioned how you know, the book talks about um, fear of loss and fear of impermanence being a primary driver for creating systems, oppression, uh, sexism, racism, homophobia, all of them. 
Um, and I think this is a prime example uh, if we're going to talk about time, you know, and, and fear of loss of time. So, so that white people can have more comfort and more time and more access, we pay the cost down to our children. But like they're, they don't worry about their lives to the same degree. Like it, this is not an equal, we're not walking down the street. We're not going into job interviews. We're not walking through the store with the same level of hypervigilance in our bodies, even in meditation retreats. Like when I'm the only black person just sitting quietly minding my peaceful ass business. Can I curse in this, by the way? I think um, so. Okay, all right. Maybe I'll turn it. <laughs> <laughs> just in case, uh, minding my business. Uh, oh, I can. <laughs> All right. So, you know, even when I'm minding my own damn business, being in my body is a, like a constant reminder or awareness in the ways in which I can die. Like not just the physical death or not just police violence, which comes to mind immediately when you're talking about black folks and death, but, you know, the death of self. And, and the way that I know myself and who I imagine myself to be as someone who is capable, who is um, intelligent and articulate, and then coming into contact with a, a white person who immediately demeans my intelligence because of who I am. So that like there's that, that death of self in that moment and that constant renegotiation, that constant work to bring myself back to life, to be who I know myself to be. Um, but when it comes to black children, this is something like they are experiencing those types of deaths from an early age. You know, um, a the, the the type of death that their parent is talking to them about that concrete physical death of like, hey, don't uh, be careful how you point that toy gun when you're in a park because a grown grown ass white guy might think that you are a menace. Or be careful walking through um, the store with your, your hands in the pot of your pockets because you know some white woman might be afraid and think that you are a terrorist. Um, and then there are the, the moments of death that black children experience um, being in the classroom. You know, um, hey, you, know, you can be smart, but not too smart. You're smart for a black kid, i.e. the implication is black kids aren't supposed to be smart even though the child like the child didn't come into the world of in this awareness. The child is intelligent and is leaning into their intelligence, but they're they're experiencing that death of self um, when when in a classroom talking to teachers and classmates who can't see them as an actual human being, and then starts projecting things onto them um, that is a death to their spirit. So so these are those conversations black parents have as well um, but I really wanted to highlight the other ways in which black parents have to talk to their children um, in a way that is grounded in death with a small d is what I'm gonna <laughs> gonna call it um, because these these children don't get to just come into the world and live into themselves they come into a world that is telling them who they are and who they are not um, more often who they are not. And, it, and it's a constant stripping of their humanity and there, there is never ending death in that. Yeah, it's really heartbreaking. Um, this is reminding me of something my wife was sharing with me earlier today about a friend of hers who has a friend with a 13 year old black, black male child who was saying, if he saves up his money for the next five years, he can have, he'll be able to afford a bulletproof vest by the time he's 18. And just like how heartbreaking that is, that that's where his mind, that's what he's planning for because he already knows at 13. Um, yeah. Yeah. As you were speaking, I was just thinking about our humanity as black people and, and in particular black women. Um, and thinking about the ways in which we constantly have our boundaries crossed mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And there's this passage um, where you speak about your experience of officiating a wedding and these two drag queens show up and 
are sort of quote unquote in blackface just in how they're acting or interacting. Um, and you, you talk about how as black women, we can't even embody our full selves yet. Here you have these, I guess, two white males, mm -hmm. um, two white male drag queens um, <laughs> enacting, you know, what they think blackness is or black femaleness is. Um, would you mind speaking to that a bit? Yeah, um, it's just a, a, an additional layer uh, of tragedy and perversion in this entire system. Like not only are black people and black women in particular, um, since that's who we're speaking about, um, not only are we denied the right to exist as we are, like as we are born to be in flesh, actual human beings, not only are we denied that right and constantly having our light snuffed out, whether it's the black hairstyles that are, uh, or black, uh, black girl hairstyles that are um, banned in schools, um, or you know whether it's being punished or disciplined at an exceedingly high rate compared to you know our um, white female counterparts, but people who aren't us get to exist in like a a shell a shell of what we represent. And they, they get to, to don that when, they, when they're when they ready and celebrate what we are constantly told that we should feel ashamed of mm -hmm. and get to celebrate the very things that make us feel, um, that we're told make us unworthy, like our sexuality, you know? Um, these things get to be a source of, of pride and celebration by the very people who ultimately have disdain for the life that produces it. And we see that so much in our culture. I mean, that's essentially what cultural appropriation is, you know, and, and cultural appropriation. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm queer, uh, I, I have a wife and as a member of the LGBTQ community, consistently observing the trends in the LGBT community and what gets uh, labeled as, as, as strong and, and admirable is just a, a, a ripoff and a uh, poor caricature of black womanhood. Mm -hmm. um, and in these same communities, like anti-blackness is as prevalent <laughs> as ever, pervasive as ever. Um, and you know, same just in, in the world at large, uh, Miley Cyrus gets, you know, she gets kudos or she gets to build a career off of um, twerking or a dance that has been a part of African-American culture, just black culture just for God knows how long. I don't know, twerking has been around since I was, I've, I've always known what twerking was, right? Um, but this white girl gets to take it and make it into a thing and then put, put on this caricature of black womanhood, build an entire career off of it, um, be praised for, you know, what she has ripped and stolen from our culture. Meanwhile, uh, Black women are denigrated. Uh, it's told that, you know, we are hypersexual and yada, yada, yada um, for the same things um, and told that we are less worthy for the same things that are actually from our culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's enraging to say the least. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also thinking, so thank you for that. Um, there's a part where you talk about grief being used to avoid accountability specific, like you were specifically speaking about within the black community itself, mm -hmm. um, in social, in social justice spaces. And I was wondering if you could share more about what you mean by avoiding accountability. For sure. Um, so I talk about the, in the book, I couldn't write about everything, <laughs> even though I wanted to, uh, so it had to be very targeted. And what I focused on specifically, um, was what I felt was most pressing, um, in our culture. Um, and, and for me as an LGBTQ black woman and the, the various types of systemic trauma that I experienced, and that was, uh, the consequence of, 
um, white supremacy, white patriarchy, whatever you want to call it, um, and how the fear of impermanence experienced by people who are wielding um, white privilege, male privilege, straight privilege, whatever it might be, how their relationship to grief actually um, actually means that me and people like me experience significantly more suffering and grief because they won't deal with their shit. Uh, but I also wanted to elucidate that this isn't particular just to people who we see who have social power in this moment. This is a human thing to do. And yeah, like we can point to the white patriarchy and clearly um, there are a shit ton of issues there. And at the same time, we see the, the remnants of that same pattern, that same human pattern to avoid grief and fear of loss, even if one has experienced tremendous amounts of grief and fear of loss to what, no fault of one's own. So in addition to that inherent fear of loss that we're born with, having um, additional trauma inflicted onto you because of who you are, um, that can still be used to cause harm to people within the community. Um, and an example of this is, um, you know, black, assist black men who cling to their patriarchal privilege or feel that because they've experienced racial trauma, there's no way they can be held accountable or, you know, um, called or called in, called out, whatever you want to call it, um, for the damage that they inflict upon black women as a result of their patriarchal privilege. Um, and in social justice circles or, you know, LGBT communities, um, it's like uh, other examples would be, you know, I, or I think that the example I used in the book was um, being in a Facebook group and watching someone say something hurtful to someone who was struggling with mental illness. And instead of the person who said something hurtful, let's call them person A, simply apologizing to person B, you know, the, the trauma and grief that person A had experienced as an LGBTQ person was basically used to deflect responsibility for the fucked up thing that they said. Mm -hmm. When just say, just say, I'm sorry and own it, <laughs> like, you know, just because you have XYZ uh, social identity and you experience harm in XYZ ways, does that mean that you then have a pardon or a pass for the harm that you also perpetuate uh, against someone else. You know, it, it it means that there is perhaps greater empathy. It means that there can perhaps, you know, if we can find ways, provide greater support, but ultimately the harm originated or was caused by person A. And therefore it was on person A <laughs> to own that. Uh, and that is not what happened in that situation. Um, so, so that's an example of what I was talking about. Thank you. It just seems like it's really hard for people to take account of, take accountability at times. Um, yeah, it is. Whether it's pride or shame or yeah, who knows. Um, there's a couple of other passages that I'm thinking about. And as you were just speaking about, um, black women and black men, I wanted to read a passage that really struck me. I'm um, gonna get your thoughts on it. Uh, so you say, dominance is often shaped by what it isn't. So in a society in which dominance is synonymous with whiteness and masculinity, black female bodies are often used as the ruler against which everyone else measures their, their superiority mm -hmm. and with which black women are, with, with which black women track their failure to measure up. Um, can you share more about that? Yeah. Oh, and also, can we come back to, to after I answer this question, you, you made a statement that actually got my mind thinking about what it is that keeps people from um, just taking accountability. And I, I want to circle back to that because I had a thought. Um, but um, the quote was um, about Black women being the, the measuring stick. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, so... I didn't. I mentioned that identities are formed by who they are and what they what they aren't. Um, so, presumably, if I am rich in money, then I'm not poor. If I am not intelligent, or if I, you know, I I do not like this term. I can't. Um, 
I want to say stupid because that is what comes to mind and that's something that's thrown around. Um, but that I wish I could off the top of my head think of a better term. And that would mean that I am not, um, I guess, in, intelligent by whatever standards are being set, right? Mm -hmm. So how I see myself is based on what I to I'm told and what I believe I am and what I'm not. Mm -hmm. And if you look at social hierarchies in, in the, the US and how they're defined, like white womanhood is defined in its relationship to black womanhood. Um, and part of that um, mm -hmm. comes with the protections that white women have by virtue of being white that black women do not have by virtue of being black. Black manhood or black masculine, no, I'm gonna go with manhood because there's a difference between manhood and masculinity and I get more in depth uh, on that in the book. Uh, that's a separate topic. Um, is also defined um, by Black womanhood. You know, you are Black, but you are not a woman, and there are certain things that you expect by virtue of being a man. There are certain privileges that you should at the very least get, you know, even though you're Black because you're a man. There are privileges that white women um, should get even though they're a woman. So mm -hmm. if you're, like, looking at the history of identity construction in the U.S., um, from when Black people are, are brought over as, as slaves. And then you look at how relationships between white men um, and, and Native women and Black women and white women and white and Black men had to change by virtue of bringing in, you know, these new people um, within the, the master-slave relationship. Um, Black women are the standard in which other people build their identity you know, in terms of what they can expect, what privileges they can expect in relationship to Black women, um, and what privileges they don't expect because of whatever is a given um, by whatever system of oppression um, is, is relevant to them. And that could be, you know, patriarchy for, for white women or, or racism for Black men, whatever, whatever the system might be. Um, and ultimately, it supports white patriarchy. <laughs> you know, people, you know, people want to dismantle the whole system in theory and so that theory requires actual action that means that folks are losing something in the moment and it's that loss like that grip on the little bit of power um, that one has that ultimately allows the system to stay in place because people are afraid uh, of losing the the little bit that they have because ultimately privileges um systemic oppression is, is built to ensure that certain privileges give you access to, to more time so that the reality of impermanence is not a direct threat to you. Every time you mention impermanence, I keep thinking the only constant is change. And I have to tell myself that all the time because it's hard, you know, like everything is impermanent, nothing stays the same. But you wanted to circle back to the what I was mentioning about accountability. You had a thought about that? Yeah. Um, it's interesting when, when you were talking about, and this is, I, I haven't like sat with this and, and toyed with it um, a lot. So this is just off the cuff. <laughs> so work with me. But um, you were talking about shame and, and what it is that that prevents people from really leaning into accountability. And I believe that it extends from grief as well, because mm -hmm. One of the things that I mentioned in the book is that, you know, if you aren't aware of how grief is functioning in your life, if you aren't aware to, of your relationship to fear of impermanence and fear of loss, then grief drives you. And it's driving you because you don't know that it's in the backseat, right? And I believe that cultures have found ways to manipulate that to some degree. I mean, capitalism manipulates our relationship to grief all the time, whether or not, you know, it's an ad that we're watching that's telling us, that's implicitly telling us that there's something that we lack. Um, it could be like a beauty commercial or something. Uh, so then we feel compelled to buy something, um, like buy this makeup or this push-up bra, or whatever it is that's supposed to make us feel more beautiful because having access to that then gives us access to relationships um, and other types of cultural capital, which leads to other types of capital and resource uh, resources. Um, so we're constantly having our grief manipulated in capitalism in general, you know, working at a job you don't like and that's stressful and that is toxic as fuck, but you need your health insurance because without health insurance, your health isn't taken care of. And what <laughs> what is closer to, you know, what other reminder is there of the reality of impermanence and, and death and not being able to, to see a doctor when you need one. Um, 
But in the same way, uh, fear of loss um, and, and being ostracized and being disconnected from, from people has been something that's been used to um, control or like guide society in general. Like you don't behave in certain ways because you know that, or we, all of us know that, you know, certain types of behaviors mean that um, are unacceptable. And that means that we lose access to relationships and community. You know, we, people know, or I just ask, I'm gonna use myself as an example, um, if, if cursing was okay, right? Because I am aware that there are contexts in which cursing is not okay. Mm -hmm. And if I curse in those contexts and I lose access to that space, those relationships and whatever else that might mean. Um, so I think like in the, the case of the social justice example specifically um, to, for person A to have been, had their ableism called into question, you know, the association with ableism, you alluded to shame. Um, it is it, shameful. Um, and also you're not supposed to be, to be ableist, right? Like we have, you're not supposed to do certain things that make you a bad person. Um, and if you do things that make you a bad person, then you risk losing the communities and, and the people you want to be in connection with. And I think that that can be particular, uh, particularly um, poignant for, for communities that have been marginalized where we don't have access to the same people. Like we have a smaller, <laughs> pool of act, uh, pool of people to, to, to pull from to begin with. Um, so then that fear can be amplified. But, but that, that fear of you know, loss of community and ostr um, ostracization is something that humans experience across the board. So when you know, racist ass white guy hears, you know, he's racist, oh, I got an example, Papa John. <laughs> this guy, I was watching on YouTube, um, Homeboy legit said, I am not racist. Had been caught using the N-word and then said that in the same I am not racist sentence said that he had been working for 20 months to remove the N-word from his, from his dialogue. Wow. Now, sir, <laughs> that sounds mighty racist to me. Right. Like your actions sound like the epitome of racism. However, you know that being called racist or being associated with racist, uh, racism means that you lose access to certain things, to certain people, certain relationships you don't have. You know, even if your actions have this, the say the actual the impact of racism, you calling people the inward, bro. So, so yeah, I think it's that fear of loss and that you know unattended grief that makes people respond viscerally because they immediately think, oh shit. What can I lose or what's at stake if I am this person and then other people don't want to have the same type of relationship with me? Mm -hmm. That makes so much sense. Yeah, fear of loss. I'm thinking about sort of connections, fear of loss, like uh, of tangible things too, like money. Mm -hmm. you know, losing, losing one's job, capital income. Um, there's like a whole spectrum, but that, I mean, that just makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just having different things or images pop into my head from the book. And I was thinking about towards the end of the book, you talk about liberation and when I think about liberation, I really think about showing up as, as my full self. Mm -hmm. And as a black human being, that's oftentimes quite difficult for me to bring my full self, like whether it's, you know, to this interview, to work, to, 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 to different settings. And there's a, there's a point in the book where you're, where there's a young man whose father has recently passed away and he's in his grief and the hospital calls either security or police on him. Mm -hmm. um, and you come back. I believe you had stepped away to tend to another family. Um, and I just found myself, oh, and also his aunt admonishes him for how he's dressed. Mm -hmm. And I just found myself enraged and in tears because he 
you know, every his humanity was really stripped away in that moment. And all people saw was like this terrorist or this, I don't, I don't know what, like this, this monster, if you will, as opposed to this young man who's grieving. Um, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, um, as black people, as women, um, we are constantly made responsible for shit that has nothing to do with us. And that's, you know, and, and it starts with our, with the relationship to grief and impermanence. Like the whole system of oppression pushes off the grief or the, or the fear of loss experienced by our oppressor onto us such that we become responsible for it. And in that situation, in the example that you gave, that young man became responsible for this white woman's you know, own grief and, and, and own anxiety and discomfort such that he couldn't grieve the loss. I believe it was of his grandfather. I don't recall um, the story fully. Um, I do recall also feeling a loss of time because I'm with another family and I can't support that family who had been there for an hour, that woman who waited for an hour before I could even get there <laughs> because, because of what was going on with the white nurse and, and the young black man. And then I had to leave her prematurely only after 20 minutes of seeing her. Hmm. So even she, you know, as a downstream effect is losing time and suffering because of this white woman's relationship or avoidance of her own anxiety and grief. And I think systemic I know systemic oppression does this in a variety of ways. So in this example, this young black man was made responsible for shit that wasn't his responsibility. Somebody was uncomfortable with the fact that his pants were hanging hanging off the way that they were. That ain't got nothing to do with him. Like those, those his pants in the same way that a woman walking down the street in shorts, however short they are, revealing however much she wants to reveal and got like that other people's discomfort about how she dresses and her body is not her responsibility. Mm -hmm. Like their anger, their lust, their desire, um, their, their violence, that is not on her, but we live in a culture that is constantly going to push other people, displace other people's grief and, 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 and their anger and their shit onto people who have been marginalized within um, the system. And that is what he experienced. And, I, and as black people, we have been taught that our key to salvation, which we associate with freedom, comes from adopting those standards and those rules. But again, we can never be better than that which we um, imitate. And, and adopting those rules can keep us alive from moment to moment, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are plenty of examples where it, it, it don't make no difference. Sandra Bland, for example mind her own damn business, right? Um, so, or um, Elijah, like it's maybe, you know, we, we hope that it can buy us more time, but in constantly being invested in our salvation moment to moment and taking on the anxieties and fears of other people, um, which, you know, in, in a lot of cases we have to for our survival or for hopes or survival, yeah. we are not able to focus on what it actually takes to be liberated because of the cost, because, you know, the people were given power that does not belong to them in our system um, as a result of their fear of loss, have the ability to wreak irreparable havoc on our lives to cause even greater loss than the losses that we experience. Mm -hmm. That was really powerful. Thank you for that. Um, in thinking about liberation, I'm also thinking about something that you reference sort of throughout the book or speak to. You talk about mindfulness and meditation and um, your meditation practice. And I guess I'm curious, has that led to, you said that you, you've said in the book also that liberation is not like a destination, it's a, it's a process. Mm -hmm. So I was gonna say, has that led to your own liberation, but it's not a, there's not a destination. So has it helped you <laughs> in your process, in your liberation process? I, I mean, I guess I, I'm here. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I believe so. Um, and, and I say, I don't know because I'm not, um, 
I think without context and, and the book, the way that the listener might be imagining or defining liberation might be different than how I'm describing it. Um, but if we're talking about the liberation that just feels good and feels powerful all the time, no, like I don't believe that that's a real thing and it's not something that I aspire towards. If we're talking about the type of liberation that comes from um, showing up authentically um, and, and vulnerably and um, living into my, my own humanity um, moment to moment and choosing myself, like choosing myself and my humanity um, and the humanity of my people and the communities I've served, then yes, that I, I do believe that that's the type of liberation I'm experiencing and it is a process. A lot of the work that I do is about helping people um, find their own personal freedom. And I really just like the sort of the, the, the latter definition that you gave. Um, Cause I think for a lot of black folks, we're not free you know, that we're not liberated for all the reasons that you said, you've mm-hmm. illustrated in the, in this conversation today. Um, I guess something else I'm curious about um, as I'm just looking, noticing time is, w- are there things that you really want your reader to take away from the book or is there anything that you kind of want folks to walk away with or, or black women or the black community in particular to walk away with in reading the book? Um, not that I can, <laughs> not that I can think of. I find, I, so I find the question funny. Uh, can I share something with you? Please. Okay, cool. <laughs> so funny thing, when I wrote this book, I know it's called Grieving While Black, but I did not know who would read it. So backtrack, um, I had started, um, uh, a, a project or business a few years ago, um, that you know produced um, ebooks and kits and meditations specifically for Black women um, to address our anger uh, and subsequent grief from experiencing misogynoir. And girl, I wrote everything myself. Use nothing but pictures of Black women. Hire Black marketers. Um, have my Black female friends looking at it and you know just giving me honest feedback. And the only people who were drawn to this were white women. And I really fucked away. And I remember being in this group of Black, you know, women who were starting their businesses and, and other Black women gave me the feedback of, your audience is whoever shows up. So huh. this is who you thought your audience was. <laughs> Apparently, this is not your audience, so go with it, right? So when I was writing Grieving While Black, I honestly started the project about four years ago, but I didn't realize I was starting the project. Um, and then I signed the, the contract for the book at the end of 2019 and finished it in like February, 2020. Um, but initially, you know, for me, typically when people are thinking about grief and, and, and blackness or in relationship to racism, they are specifically thinking about the grief that black people are feeling as a result of systemic racism. And of course that comes out very strongly in my book because I am a black woman experiencing the consequences of these various systems. Um, At the same time, when I was writing the book, I wanted to point the finger back at the people who were responsible for perpetuating that grief because of their own relationship to fear of loss. Um, So when I was writing it, you know, my interest was Telling though, or showing those people how they can be more present for you know their experience and get their shit together, so we aren't experiencing the down the downstream effects of their relationship to their own grief and fear of loss, and it's all interconnected, or it, it's all tied together. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to share that like that was my intention and like that was my audience when uh, writing the book. <laughs> but like you know, I take on these projects and I will have a goal in mind and the way that it is um, interpreted and who picks it up. Like it's it's out of my hands. Like once it's in a store or you know once it's like available um, to the public in general, I don't have any more. Um, say and what becomes of it which is both terrifying and exciting um so yeah like your, your question made me think about that that whole experience of not knowing who was gonna read this or who would actually you know find it um most helpful and what people would take from it based on their social location and lived experience 
That makes a lot of sense. And as you were describing this product, I was thinking, do you still offer this? Because I would, I would personally love, love to get a copy. So I think that's so interesting that white women were particularly drawn to it. I was, I mean, I went with it. I was, I was like, I don't know how this came to be, <laughs> but like, I don't, I, I mean, I have meditations, trap beats, everything, but I don't, <laughs> I have no idea, but whatever, you know, it was what it was. Um, unfortunately, I discontinued it due to COVID because I wasn't able to, to go to fairs um, to sell it. And, you know, they were stocked in a local LA store, but then that store closed down. So yeah, COVID has kind of impacted my ability to continue that project. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. Yeah, of course. Um, sort of a half half formed question I have as I was, again, as I'm just sitting and listening to you is, again, the book really resonated with me and I had to stop just to cry oftentimes throughout the book and just like breathe deeply. There was just so much that hit so deeply. And at the end or towards the end, you talk about love and I remember writing in the margin margins do is Brisha saying we need to redefine love but I can't remember like the exact passage um which you're speaking about love and I just was thinking you know what is what is love how are we defining love and as black people do we need to redefine love to kind of, again to sort of be on this process towards liberation I don't know if that's resonant for you but oh yeah uh, thank you for that question I think that's something really powerful to end on. We absolutely need to redefine love. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's an ongoing process. You know, a lot of folks in the community wouldn't recognize my relationship, you know, with my wife as a, a representation of, of love. But ultimately, um, or even like the way we talk about Black love um, and what that means, you know, ultimately, I believe that anything that adds to the fullness, um, the, the wholeness and the healing of a black person is black love, mm -hmm. right? Uh, assuming it's not causing harm <laughs> to someone else, you know, uh, but you know, with consenting adult relationships. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's how I would, you know, find, define black romantic love, but like love is just so, we sell love short in the same way that we often sell God short and making God out to be this being in the sky who's omnipotent, uh, omnipresent, omniscient, you know? And when we're constantly selling, oh, and, and we sell power short and when we're constantly selling these profound experiences short, we, limit our ability to experience them um, and to access them. So I would invite all of us, myself included, I'm inviting myself on this journey, um, to be willing to constantly um, redefine and explore what love is and, and what it represents on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. That's so beautifully stated. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm aware that we're at time. I just want to thank you again and time in terms of our conversation. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank you again so much. It's just, this has really been a true pleasure and honor. Um, and with that, I'm going to transition over to the questions from our audience, unless you have any final remarks you want to make. No, I wanted to thank you. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you for reading the book, for um, sharing your thoughts and reactions. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I will go to the questions. Let's see here. Uh, the first one is, as someone who works and writes on grief, how does that affect you every day? as so many of us are dealing with grief due to white supremacy, with racism, the pandemic, loss of livelihood, et cetera. What would you suggest us suggest to us as we live with grieving on a daily basis? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I got a 
similar, like, I'm going to tie this into a, a question I received for um, an interview that never ran, <laughs> but this, this question kind of reminds me of it. Uh, the interviewer asked me if it's possible to inoculate oneself against grief. Um, and when you ask about how I go about navigating this, I don't think it has the same impact. Like I'm, I'm very much grieving, do not get me wrong. Um, I have been knocked on my ass by this past year. Um, and I don't believe that it has had the same impact um, on me because I don't, I am not just seeing grief present in my day-to-day -day life. Like, I feel that I've cultivated a relationship to, with all of the little griefs in transition. Like a, a transition is a, a very intimate relationship with grief by delving into my own experience of, or my own relationship to impermanence for so long, um, which is why I encourage people to, to do that um, such that when the inevitable griefs hit, it doesn't hit as hard because grief is coming. You know, the, the loss that you fear is coming. It's a matter of how. You can't control the how, you can't control the when, you can't know the how or the when, but it's coming. Um, but cultivating an honest relationship with impermanence um, on a day-to-day -day basis and recognizing it makes it such that when the big griefs and, and the, the, the heavy shit hits, it hits, but it feels more like a car than a big ass truck <laughs> or a bus, you know? Um, so my when I'm working with um, clients uh, through, through close coaching um, and, and classes, I really invite them to lean into the present moment and what's coming up now. And yes, you know, if this is the beginning of your journey with really engaging grief and you've been hit with a, you've been hit with a lot of it, it's going to hurt. Um, and it is going to take a heavy investment to move through. And at the same time, um, this grief, you can learn to use the this grief as a gift um, to teach you how you want to live your life in other moments when the grief isn't as heavy. I hope that, that answers the question. Thank you. Um, the next one here says, how can we reconcile the often perceived passivity of Buddhism with radical social justice movements? Is there a balance? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, y'all see me. I just, I was just talking to someone uh, was it yesterday, like, I don't know how Sometimes people think that because I'm Buddhist, that I'll let certain shit slide. <laughs> but like, no, you know, like if you, if you read anything about Buddha himself, Siddhartha, like he's kind of an asshole, a very flawed human being. So, so um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that there, there's a common misconception. And, and honestly, I've, I've practiced Buddhism for like 10 years and I, I see, where it comes from, because I, I think a lot of um, a lot of not advanced, but um, like veteran practitioners of Buddhism um, use Buddha because uh, Buddhism because anything can be used as a tool to avoid accountability, avoid yourself, avoid showing up in the world. Right? Um, I mean, you can do the same thing with Christianity and people frequently use Christianity in that way. Um, but Buddhism, you know, with its emphasis on mindfulness and, and, and sitting, um, definitely gets a bit bad rep for <laughs> reasons that I can understand. Um, but Buddhism isn't passive in what it calls us to do and how it calls us to be in relationship to ourselves and to the world is not passive. Um, you know, I, completed my Buddhist chaplaincy training at Upaya and there's an emphasis. And, and right now I'm a steward for their socially engaged Buddhist program. This one's newly launched, but the chaplaincy program focused on socially engaged Buddhism. Um, and 
I imagine that that title was given because of the misconceptions of what it means to be Buddhist um, and to just sit on the mat and be passive and not use um, the teachings and the transformation to bring about actual change and transformation. Um, but to be frank, you know, if the idea of Buddhism is to transform suffering, and that is what you're doing by engaging your relationship to impermanence and sitting on the mat, uh, on the mat, you know, any change that occurs internally it occurs externally. So it is literally becoming the change you want to see. Um, so as that change is happening in you and you're interacting in the world and with other people, then you inevitably, inevitably bring that change and those lessons to every aspect of your life. Um, and if you are actually using the practice authentically um, in the way that it, like we aspire to use it, um, then that would be inevitable. Thank you. Uh, the next question says, <clears throat> several audience members are curious about Buddhist practice. How do you recommend people practice staying in touch with impermanence or even mindfulness in an approachable day-to-day -day way? Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know how to put this in a, in a nutshell because um, part of like when I'm working with, with folks, especially in the anti-racist work I do, this is what we start to do and to, to develop. Um, and even for that, I give like a, like we start with like a seven day crash course before moving into like, you know, the, and seven days is just not enough. But, but ultimately I, I, I would say, start where you are and with what you're given. Um, like some of the, the folks in the, the socially engaged Buddhist um, training that I um, am doing with Upaya come from, a variety of backgrounds. You know, some of them are brand new to Buddhism, some of them are brand new to Zen specifically. And then Zen has all of its own unique rules that are different from Tibetan Buddhism, yada, yada, yada. And it can seem overwhelming. Um, but all of those things aren't really relevant. You know, like the core of Buddhism is to practice itself. And then all of the other things are things that you can branch out into that can support your practice or maybe, you know, they don't. Um, but making a commitment every day, like for myself, I make a commitment every day. Uh, first thing in the morning, I'm going to sit, you know? So uh, before I start work, before I, I do anything, before I eat breakfast, I am going to sit um, and get in touch with myself and my, what is happening for me before I do or touch anything else. For that day, you know, before I open my email, before I'm in contact with people, before I'm on Zoom, this is what I need to do um, so that any action that comes from me is coming from a place of awareness. And when there's that awareness, then like the things that that I can build on top of that can be um, more intentional and, and more purposeful. Thank you, Felicia. Um... This next question says, what do you think about community grief practices? Are there practices that exist that you feel are effective ways for folks to process grief in community? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, my mind immediately goes to, it depends on what the community is. You know, um, the practices that I've cultivated and, and that I cultivate with people is very dependent upon like the, the space I'm entering into um, and dependent upon my, my personal tools. So I am originally from South Carolina. Um, I have like a, a mixture of like hoodoo and, and Southern Baptist in, in my tradition that I combine with um, Buddhism for myself. Um, so I'm not sure if this is coming from a community facilitator or for someone who is in a community that needs grief work or healing. If it's from a facilitator, then I would um, invite you to 
ask the group and be open to, to what wisdom the group has because every group comes with its, its own wisdom that it can um, teach us as facil facilitators and teachers about how we need to show up for that group. Um, if you are someone who's in a group <laughs> and asking this question, um, then I would encourage A, getting in touch with practices that have been healing to you in the past and B, um, exploring and trying different things to see what feels good so that you can start building kind of like a Greek toolkit um, for, for now and in the future and just recognize that that's a ongoing process as you lead into what works for you. Thank you. Um, let's see, can you share with us a moment of joy you had while writing this book? So much of grief is about deep sadness, but there are moments of joy, laughter, peace, et cetera. I wondered if there were, were those moments during the writing of this book. Oh, of course. Um, and I also don't think that grief is just deep <laughs> moments of uh, sadness either. Um, so I, I think a, a quote I have in the book is that grief is bigger than what's already happened to us. It's connected to what we fear and what we love and what we aspire towards. And when I talk about love and aspiration, there's joy and love and aspiration. There's joy and, and possibility. Uh, and there, there's also grief. Um, and possibility and aspiration and love, like these are present and future things. These aren't concrete things that are hap that have happened in the past. Um, and I talk about the way that love is very much, I mean, sorry, grief is very much present in my relationship with my wife. And I wake up every morning feeling grief because I realize it's one less day that I'm gonna have with this person who I freaking love um, and adore. And I feel love and happiness. Vast majority of the time I'm with her. Um, and I, I think in the, actually that might've been an Instagram post. <laughs> like maybe in the book, I said something. Um, about, you know, going off to college or, or getting married. Like these are really happy things that are transitions that come with grief because there is that recognition of, of loss of a way of being and of not knowing. And whenever you have not knowing, you have possibility and you have like the possibility of joy, possibility of grief, the reality of both. Um, so yeah, like this writing this book did not feel like sadness or, or like just overwhelming sadness or heaviness to me because that's not the relationship that I have with grief as a whole. I mean, there there is deep sadness and there's also, um, you know, boundless joy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question here and it says, do either of the speakers have any resources for individuals that wish to get therapy around grief and sorrow? Well, therapist, <laughs> <laughs> you got a resource. <laughs> In order to answer the question, I would I would need a lot more information. Um, I mean, there's of course there's different clinics you could go to, like community mental health clinics you could go to. Um, I could connect you to a particular therapist, but I would need a lot more information to do that. And I'm happy if, if the people can just, I can get my contact information out there and people can reach out to me and I can help connect them. I'm happy to do that. Do you, oh, have, any, uh, do you yeah. have any thoughts? Um, yeah, my, my thoughts were like, I mean, thank you for, for rolling with me. Um, yeah, I mean, I, my thoughts are similar because I'm not sure the source of grief. I mean, there are certain types of grief. Yes, I can. Um, I support people around and then, you know, sometimes folks come to me with grief related to specific types of trauma, depending on the type of trauma, I'm not equipped to do that. So um, I would concur that it really does depend on the type of grief um, one is moving through. I also see a note here that um we're able to send out, compile a list of resources and we can send those out to, to folks that attend it. So we'll do that cool. as well. Okay. Um, okay, well, um, I wanna thank you again. Um, our time has come to a close. This has been a true pleasure and honor and thank you so much. Do you have any final remarks before we go? Um, I've really enjoyed the hell out of this. I appreciate you for facilitating. Um, this is just, 
yeah, this has been wonderful. Um, so thank you for your time and for your thoughtfulness and for your willingness to be in community with me. Of course, thank you too. Um, now we're gonna go back to Alex for some final words. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We hope you will join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded, so if you would like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at the same link and later on our Facebook page. We will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at www.ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.